taking a break from our spiritual war series to address a different topic. And I'm kind of doing this for felt need reasons. Uh, just a, a sense that this is a, a topic that uh, needs to be talked about. Um, uh, and I know that other people talk about this stuff, but I want to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> Um, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine kind of ongoing now for multiple months, uh, a lot of believers, a lot of Christians are, are reading the news with, with kind of with an end times lens. And, and I know that many Christians always read the news with an end times lens and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and, and, but really, I mean, who can blame them? I mean, I, I'm not an avid end times guy. Okay. I mean, this is the first time I think that I have ever devoted any podcast time to, uh, the end times and all this stuff has got me taking a second look. So, uh, that, that's what we're going to do for the next few episodes. Um, we're going to look at the return of Jesus. Now, um, before we get going, I, I want to lay down uh, a few ground rules, so uh, and just things that you, I, I want you to know up front, uh, so you'll kind of know where I'm coming from uh, on all this. Uh, first of all, this is not going to be a comprehensive study of the Book of Revelation. Now, I, I have led studies through it before, uh, and I'm being kind of half tempted to do it again by my life group, but. Uh, uh, because they're, they're, they they ask me if we could do that. <laughs> I don't know if they're joking or if they're, or if they're serious at this point. But uh, I, any serious study of Revelation is going to take a long time. Okay. Uh, I would even say a very long time. And, and I just don't have that, <laughs> that kind of time, uh, at least on the podcast uh, in this season of my life. Uh, number two, in my time as a Christian, uh, I have been all over the map in terms of what I believe about end times. I was brought up in the church with a particular point of view, uh, and I've met people. I've been to other churches. I have read books. I have, you know, watched uh, documentary. I mean, I have been exposed to every point of view. So I, I, you could say that I appreciate things from every point of view that's out there. Almost, almost. No, I, may, I might be exaggerating a bit there. Uh, but because of that, I'm not going to make anyone 100% happy. Uh, if, if you're looking for, you know, a, a, an end times teacher, you, I mean, I'm probably not your guy. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to make everybody 100% happy. Three, uh, what I do believe very firmly, okay, is that what we believe about end times should make sense. If I, if I could go back in time and have an end times discussion with a first century Christian, it sh my position should not confuse them. Now, uh, so I, I tend to, to question interpretations that rely too heavily on 21st century geopolitical conditions. Now, I will admit that there are things that have happened in the 20th century that have changed the game, like Israel becoming a nation again. Um, that probably isn't a concept that a first century believer would have uh, had or been exposed to, and it did happen. And so that is, and you know, some people call Israel a super sign, and and I don't, I'm not disagreeing with that. I do think that it's an important thing. Um, I'm not sure that what I think about it's going to line up with everybody, but uh, I, I do recognize that the that Israel being a nation again is a new thing. It's a it's a it's a sign of uh, of some kind. Uh, and we'll get a little bit more into that at some point in this series. Uh, number four, if you really want to label me, okay, I consider myself a historic premillennialist. I'll say that again, a historic premillennialist. Okay. But like I said before, I see merit in other positions as well. So I'm kind of an open-handed 
historic premillennialist. So if if you if you don't know what that means, we'll get to it. Pre, historic premillennial. Ugh, I can't talk. Historic premillennial. Historic premillennialist. <laughs> okay, we're, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, along with the other uh, positions. Number five, I'm doing this partially in response to the accusation that pastors don't want to preach on end times anymore. Now, I don't think that's a universal truth, okay? There are pastors who, who are happy to teach about this. Uh, but I, technically, this is not a sermon series, okay? And I neither am I the senior pastor of my church, but this is one way that I can respond to the accusation that pastors don't seem to want to preach or teach on end times. So we're going to preach and teach on it for a little while. Okay. Uh, number six, I'm also doing this partially to clear the air on where I stand on the end times. Okay. Now I've not been fighting with people over it. Okay. I've had some friendly back and forth with, with, uh, you know, people who attend our church, on Facebook, uh, and I hope that I haven't angered them or anything. I I just post things that I find interesting, and uh, and sometimes they don't agree with it, and, and that's okay. Okay, um, we love each other, uh, but this happens on Facebook, and Facebook's a terrible place to, uh, you know, really kind of have a, 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 a an informed and important, you know, a, a good discussion about these matters. So, seven and last. Uh, I hope that by the time this is over, everyone will at least know where I stand and know that I'm not actually adversarial about any of this. Okay. So now, now that I've said all that, let, let's begin by defining the phrase end time. Okay. Or end times. Uh, I, I did a quick word search before, you know, I uh, started recording just in the preparation for this. And probably, if you if you want to go with first mentions in the scripture, uh, probably maybe the first the the best first mention of this is in Daniel chapter eight. Uh, uh, depending, maybe it depends on what translation of the Bible you're reading from. Um, but in my quick search, uh, this one came up, and it seemed to be the clearest one. Uh, the uh, you know the first clearest one. So uh, it's Daniel chapter eight verse nineteen. He said, "Behold." I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. Now, who's speaking here? This is the angel Gabriel explaining one of Daniel's visions, and he said that the vision had to do with the appointed time of the end. So this is a good, as good a place as any to define end time, okay? End times have to do with the things that the Lord has appointed to happen toward the end of the age. Simple. Okay. I like simple definitions. Uh, simple and accurate. Okay. Uh, so the popular use of the phrase refers to future events that will precede the return of Jesus that haven't happened yet. Okay. So uh, now another biblical phrase that means the same thing as last days. Now, now, a lot of I think this phrase maybe gets used a little more broadly, perhaps to encompass a, a larger period of time uh, than maybe we think of when we say end times. Uh, but it is occasionally used to refer to the end times. Uh, Paul used it that way at least once. First uh, Timothy three one says, <clears throat> "Excuse me, uh, but understand this that in the last days." There will come times of difficulty. All right. Now, so end times slash last days can be used to speak of the same thing. But here's the thing. Not everyone defines the time period that end times slash last days. Uh, not everyone defines it with the same duration of time. And herein lies the beginnings of many differences, okay? So in this first video, I'm going to break down the various differing points of view on end times, okay? And, and then I think in the videos that follow, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give a defense for each point of view, 
and, and you heard me, a defense. Yes, I can defend each point of view. And it's not because I'm smart, but it's because the Bible actually offers evidence for each one. Now, what we're going to discover is that each one has strengths and each one has weaknesses. Uh, some have more evidence than others, but the reason each position persists, as far as I mean, from for as much as I see, is because it answers the squirrely questions. One position answers the squirrely questions that the other that another position creates. Okay, for instance, the amillennial position believes that Satan has been bound ever since Jesus ascended back to the Father. Well, that's kind of a pesky position because it would seem that at least at least anecdotally that Satan hasn't been bound at all for the last 2,000 years. So premillennialism puts the binding of Satan as a future event. So that's what I mean. One position raises a squirrely question. Another position answers that question. So these, they just, that's just how it seems to happen. So here are, here, let's, let's start with the four major positions. And, and I, I'm going to just tell you up front, I'm going to read uh, an excerpt from a book called Jesus Wins, um, or it's an adaptation from uh, the, from that book. It's a book by Dayton, Dayton Hartman, um, and he, he seems to succinctly like talk about this. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to, I've got this, I've got this here on my screen. I'm going to read this to you. This is just, just for the copyright guys from here until I say so, this is not my words. Okay. These are the words of, uh, Dayton Hartman from Jesus wins. That's my reference for you. Okay. So all millennialism, uh, all millennialism's name is a clear giveaway to its defining mark. Ah, uh, Millennialism. It literally means there is no literal, open, visible thousand year reign of Christ on earth. Now, so instead, the reign of Christ is understood in a fundamentally different way. Okay. Our millennialism does not have a specific antichrist as advocated in something like the Left Behind series. Uh, however, there may be a man of sin, that's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, uh, who could fit some kind of Antichrist definition or an archetype in the modern understanding of that term. Okay. Uh, now, concerning the reign of Christ, all millennial thinkers note, uh, note rightly that the thousand year language describing the millennial period in Revelation 20 can be taken figuratively. Uh, so the thousand year period isn't a specific thousand year cycle on an actual calendar. Instead, with his resurrection and ascension, Christ began his reign. So he presently rules on earth, the millennial age through his people, and he will return physically at any moment to usher in heaven on earth. Now the role of Satan we're still talking about amillennialism, okay? Uh, Satan's influence in amillennialism has been diminished because he has been bound by Christ. So Satan himself is not presently exerting influence over the world. That's the problem we addressed earlier, or the squirrely question. Uh, amillennialism in, uh, on Israel and the church, okay? There is not a stark contrast between Israel and the church. Rather, the church is spiritual Israel because Christ is the true Israel. Uh, th this does not mean that the church has replaced Israel, but instead that the church is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that his offspring, Jesus, would bless all nations, people, groups, okay? So you can look at some key passages to, to talk that talk that seem to support this position. Uh, John chapter five, verses 28 to 29. Uh, Romans chapter eight, 17 to 23. Second Peter three, three through 14. Uh, Second Thessalonians one, five through 10. Um, so, and, and just, just, just so you know, there's some, some people who in history who are, are notable supporters of this position. Uh, you've got Augustine of Hippo, 
um, church father, uh, Martin Luther, uh, John Calvin, uh, Louis Burkhoff, C.S. Lewis, and most recently in this list, R.C. Sproul. Okay, now let's move on to post-millennialism. You have likely never met a committed proponent of post-millennialism. Now, that was not always the case. Um, early in American history, post-millennialism was, in some sense, at the American eschatology. Now it's a theological peculiarity to hear someone speak of post-millennial idea, ideas, in part because uh, post-millennialism is a difficult system to quantify. Not only is it a minority position, but post-millennial thinkers tend to disagree about the details. Um, so, the reign of Christ. Post-millennials differ as to whether the reign of Christ is 1,000 years or simply a long period of time. Uh, at its core, the distinctive of post-millennial thought is the ever-expanding progress of the gospel until the world becomes markedly Christian. Then Christ returns. The millennial age is ushered in by the unrelenting advance of the gospel. Okay, uh, The role of Satan. There is no definitive position on the role of Satan within, po within post-millennial thought. Uh, some post-millennial theologians argue that Satan was bound by Jesus, which is similar to amillennialism, while others would argue it remains a future event, which would be in agreement with pre-millennialism. What about Israel and the church? The post-millennial position agrees with amillennialism. The church is the fulfillment of Israel. The church is spiritual Israel. So uh, key passages that, that, can be, that people can point to would be Psalm chapter 2, uh, Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, Matthew 13 and, and 28, and John 12. Okay, And, and there's one, I, I, the people who are listed as the notable people of history, uh, I, I recognize a few of these names, but the one that jumps out at me is Jonathan Edwards. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, B.B. Warfield, uh, Greg Bonson, Lorraine Bettner, uh, Kenneth Gentry, and Peter Lightheart. I don't, I don't know a lot of those guys, but I know a few of them. But Jonathan Edwards uh, surprised me, honestly. Uh, now, and this is now. Let me let me call time out. This is me, not not quoting from any book. Um, Post millennialism uh, really struggled, uh, began to struggle. It was it was a very popular point of view in American history um, up until the uh, World War One, okay? Because post-millennialism re relies on the, you know, the gradual and, and, and you know, progressive uh, advance of the gospel in the world. The, the world becomes, you know, more Christian slowly. Well, World War I kind of just blew it out of the water. And then World War II, the 20th century in general, blew that one out of the water. Uh, if you want my opinion on these four positions, this one is the weakest. But as I, there are scriptures that can, you can read that, that would seem to indicate maybe this is a possibility. Okay, we already talked about those scriptures. Okay, back to the quote. Uh, let's look at premillennialism. Uh, premillennialism is often assumed to be the default view of Christians in America. That's an assumption. Uh, and this is understandable. It is presently the most common view of eschatology held by Amer American evangelicals. While evangelicals are most familiar with the primary framework of premillennial thought, many are unaware that premillennialism has two major divisions. There's historic premillennialism, the traditional form often just simply called premillennialism. And then there's dispensational premillennialism, which is often just called dispensationalism. So let's look at historic premillennialism first. This is what I said earlier is my my default label, if you will. Um, <clears throat> the reign of Christ. Christ will return physically and visibly in order to usher in the millennial reign, but historic premillennialists disagree whether the reign of Christ will be a literal thousand years or just a long period of time. Time out. I believe it'll be a literal thousand years, okay? Just so you know where I'm at. 
Uh, okay, back to the quote. The role of Satan. Satan is currently at work in the world, influencing affairs and deceiving the nations. And at the return of Christ, Satan will be bound for the duration of the millennial age. Uh, regarding Israel and the church, historic premillennialism proposes that the church is the spiritual fulfillment of Israel in a manner that is very similar to amillennialism and postmillennialism. Okay, I got to call time out here. I don't think I subscribe to that entirely. Okay, uh, I, I I do I I I I lean more with my dispensational brothers, which we'll get to here in a second about the about Israel. Now I I'll just be up frank with you. I'm not sure how far I need to go with that. Um, I, I I do believe that there are. Uh, land promises in, 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 in the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, that they are yet to be fulfilled, that I, I believe Israel today um, is is part of the fulfillment of that part of it. I don't know how. I, I, I just don't know, okay? Um, but I, I believe Israel is more important than this guy says premillennials think about it. Okay, so that's where I'm at. All right, back to the quote. Uh, key passages. This position shares many of the same key passages as amillennialism and postmillennialism. The distinction between the systems has to do with interpretation. Premillennialism places a heavier emphasis on literal interpretations of key passages than either amillennialism or postmillennialism does. Okay, I'm a literalist. Okay, uh, so some guys from history who are notable. Pre-millennialist would be Arrhenius, church father. Uh, Wayne Grudem, he's a theologian. Robert Gundry, uh, Ben Witherington III, and Craig Blomberg. Uh, I only know about Arrhenius and Wayne Grudem on, of that list. So, so don't ask me about who these other people are. All right. Now, dispensationalism. This is part two of premillennialism. Uh, dispensationalism, the reign of Christ. For most dispensationalists, the millennial reign of Christ will begin after his return at the end of a distinct seven-year period known as the tribulation. The millennial reign of Christ begins at the third coming of Christ. You heard me right, third coming. Now, that's probably, I'm talking now, uh, that's probably not how, uh, in fact, I know that's not how, um, you know, a, a dispensationalist would typically characterize that. Um, so they, they believe in two comings of Jesus, but there's a, a thing that happens seven years before his first, his second coming that this author is calling the second coming and saying that there's a third coming, which, okay, I know I'm confusing myself. Anyways, uh, back to the quote, dispensationalists propose a secret rapture con concept in which Christ returns prior to, I should have just kept reading, prior to or midway through the tribulation period to remove the church from earth. So, so okay, time out again. First coming was the one we all agree on with, you know, 2,000 years ago. Uh, according to this author, pre uh, dispensationalists say the second coming is the secret rapture. And I don't even like saying secret rapture um, I, I don't think that's the best choice of words personally to describe what happens, but that's my opinion. Uh, so that's number two, but he doesn't come all the way back to the earth. He meets the church in the clouds. And then third coming would be the actual visible physical return where he foot, sets foot down on the earth and begins his thousand year reign. Okay. Uh, I would rather not call that three comings of, of Jesus, I would say you got the first coming, you've got coming 1.5, and then you've got the second coming just to keep things, you know, the same across all these positions. So, uh, the role of Satan, uh, like historic premillennialism, dispensationalism argues that Satan is actively at work to resist the church and undermine God's people. He will be bound for the duration of the millennium and only released for a final confrontation following his thousand year captivity. All right, key passages. So while dispensationalism also shares premillennialism's more literal approach to the key passages, dispensationalism holds that Daniel chapter nine 
uh, holds it as a key passage for interpreting for interpreting the arc of history. Uh, and we'll get into it when we get to this uh, position. It's it's seventy weeks, um, and and uh, I, but we'll get to that later. Um, additionally, classic dispensationalism proposes that the content of the Bible is divided along seven dispensations or eras. Uh, while different schools of dispensationalism categorize these errors differently, one common structure is innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law, grace, and then the millennium. The key passages are interpreted through this dispensational framework. Okay, so here are your notable people who are dispensationalists. You got Lewis S. Schaefer, John Walverd. Charles Ryrie, uh, you may have heard of the Ryrie Study Bible, uh, Hal Lindsey, and John MacArthur. And uh, so I'm familiar with, uh, so, uh, I think, all of those guys. Uh, so, okay, that's the end of the quoted material. We're back to just my thoughts, okay? Uh, those are the major positions. Now, some will say, uh, what about preterism? Preterism, okay. Uh, full preterism insists that all prophecy contained in, in the New Testament, uh, well, in the Bible, okay, uh, all prophecy, uh, particularly within Revelation and the prophets, was fulfilled before the destruction of Jerusalem in the year AD 70. Uh, it does not believe in the bodily return of Christ or the bodily resurrection of believers, or the renewal of creation in a new heaven and a new earth. So this is not an orthodox position. It I won't so I won't be giving it any attention. Full preterism is heresy. I I, I will say it again. Full preterism is heresy. Okay, it denies the bodily return of Jesus. Uh, I could stop there. Forget about the rest of it. But it denies several things about uh, the bodily return of Jesus, the bodily resurrection of believers, the, re the recreation of heaven and earth. Denies those things. So it's heresy. Okay. Now, there are what's called partial preterists who believe all prophecy was fulfilled prior to 70 AD except for the return of Christ, the resurrection of believers, and the recreation of the heavens and the earth. Uh, they hold that those events are yet future, um, but their belief that Revelation chapters 12 through 19 was fulfilled either by the, the fall of Second Temple Judaism or the fall of Rome is kind of, I mean, okay, just for me, it's too metaphorical, it's too allegorical uh, uh, for this podcast host, okay? So in, in my humble opinion, my opinion, okay, partial preterists aren't heretics, but they are on the fringe of orthodox belief, for sure. Okay, they're on the fringe. So, uh, I'm not even sure how long I've been going here. Let me look here. Um, yeah, I've been going almost a half hour. So, why don't we just wrap this episode for now? So, the next episode, what we'll do is we'll begin examining these these positions a little closer. So we'll start, we'll just go in the order that they were listed here. We'll start with amillennialism. Uh, and and I, I, by the way, I know that this was a ton of information uh, and I really hope it make, I uh, really hope it made sense to you. Um, but this is one re okay. Just cards on the table. This is one reason that the accusation that pastors don't teach this stuff is because it's so convoluted with different opinions. Uh, if you have a large enough church, I will guarantee you, you've got every one of these, well, hmm, three out of four of these positions represented. Okay. I doubt there's a post-millennial. Although when we get to post-millennialism, I, I am going to talk about some, some more, uh, I would say, uh, uh, recent manifestations of something very similar. Okay. Uh, I don't know if they would consider themselves post millennials, but man, they sure if it if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck, and I and I and I think they look and talk like post millennials, but we'll get to that. Uh, so, but I think in any given church that's large enough, you will find 
three or four, these four, three of the four positions represented within the people. Okay. And, 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 and so that is, and, and well, I would, well, okay, let me back that up. You got, you'll, you'll find all millennialists and you will find, yeah, three of the four. <laughs> Sorry. My brain just short circuited. You'll find all millennialists and you'll find historic premillennialists and you will find dispensationalists in any given church that is large enough because the Bible is just not, I mean, it, it's clear to a point. Okay. Which is which leaves room for these different positions to, to, to have followers and to and to, to gain traction in the church. So I'm going to stop. Uh, I think it's a good place to stop, and we will pick this up in the next episode. We'll we'll discuss all millennialism, uh, and yes, I will attempt to defend it. Uh, but I'm not. But not. I'm not just going to defend it. I'm going to. We're going to talk about you know some of the shortcomings of it too. But I. But I want to make sure that I'm clear that it is defensible. It is. It is a, a position that can be defended and embraced. Okay. So until next time, grace and peace.